Hello, Palb. Uh, welcome to the English language revision session. Today we're going to look at the unit two writing section. And I'm going to link it to the Lifeboats paper that we looked at last week. So this is the 2022 WJC English language paper. It's the unit two and it's the writing paper. So today, or the writing section, so it's the same paper that we looked at last session when we looked at the lifeboats and the reading. OK, so we're going to go through an entire section of the writing paper so that you know how to go about it. My name is Miss Hales and I will be presenting this lesson. If you've got any questions, if you jot them down and you can join us in the live session, which will be in a couple of weeks time, and you can ask both myself and Miss Davis, who's been doing the unit three work, you can ask us any of those questions. This session should be about 45 minutes long, but obviously we're recording it so you can come back and catch up on anything or you can pause it and do the activities as we go through. So we're going to go through the entire unit two writing section, looking through the questions. And our main objective today is to make sure that you are really happy with the types of questions that you're going to get on that unit two paper, that you understand how to find the answers for them, that you're able to structure a response through planning for them, and that you're able to be um, familiar with the mark scheme and know how to answer that question. So the success criteria for the answers. So this is the front of the paper. You saw this last week if you did the reading section. This is the writing section of it. So we are today looking at the unit two paper. The unit two is the description, the narration and the exposition. So you know when you sit the unit two, you're going to have two questions and they're going to be linked to one at uh, you have a choice of two. You choose which one you want to do. So you know that description, narration, exposition, exposition are likely to come up and you choose the one that you want to do. We're only going to look at writing today. For this paper, you need to make sure you've got plenty of black pens, maybe some highlighters to start your planning. It depends how you like to plan. But the big thing for you for this paper is to know how much you can write in 45 minutes and know how much space that 350 to 500 words takes you, because you need to make sure you cover the minimum writing uh, requirement for this paper. This is the one where you have to write the slightly longer answer because you only write one answer. So let's go back to basics. You've seen this before. It's a really handy reminder. Make sure you read all the instructions on the front cover and know what you need to do. Know what you have in that paper so you don't miss anything. Make sure you use that black pen. Make sure you fill in all the relevant data, especially which answer you choose to do for the writing section. So you write down the number of the question that you're answering. <coughs> Make sure you don't miss the proofreading and the editing section. And this is the one where you choose one writing task from the two that you get. You're going to have to balance your own time. Nobody's going to remind you to move on to section B. So you have to make sure that you spend about the same amount of time on A and B. Temptation is always going to be to spend more time on the reading section because it takes you time to read and comprehend what's going on. But actually the reading and the writing are worth the same amount of marks. So just make sure that you answer both in the right amount of time you have. You need to do the proofreading, which should take you about 10 minutes, and the writing, which it says here should take you about 10 minutes planning, about 40 minutes writing. OK, so this is what the proofreading will look like. This is where you're going to have those treatises and you have to decide what is wrong. So proofreading means you've got to spot the errors. It tells you there are five. And it tells you you've got to write them correctly in the spaces below once you've circled them. So the first thing to do is to read it through and find the errors. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution, RNLI, have announced it will be making redundancies as it tries to cut costs. So I can spot two errors in that beginning section straight away. The first one I can see is that I can see the C in national, which I know is wrong. I know it should be a T. So that's the first one I'm going to circle. I'm going to I identify that as a mistake. I also think there's something strange with the have announced because it's a singular um, institution. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution has announced. Yeah, so it's, it's an institution, it's a group, it's a singular. So it doesn't need to have, it needs a has. 
It has explained that this is necessary. Now, I know how to spell necessary because I use the acronym uh, never eat chocolate, eat salad sandwiches and remain young. So I know that there isn't a double C in necessary. Never eat chocolate, eat salad sandwiches. So I know there's no double C, so I know that's wrong. So I'm going to circle that one. OK, when I look at launched, I know launched doesn't have a W in it. It's just a word that doesn't look right. So I'm going to circle that one. And it's services. Oh, right. No, OK. It's is a difficult one, but I know that this isn't an abbreviated form of it is. I know that it is belonging to them and it doesn't need that apostrophe. So national has necessary it's launched. So I go through and make sure I correct those mistakes. Please note that you have to keep the capital letters and the lowercase letters the same. Unless you're correcting a capital error mistake, the letters need to be the same as are in the, in the text. So I know that national has to have a capital letter because it has a capital letter in the text and it's the name of the institution. So I know it needs a capital letter, so I keep that capital letter in my correction. OK, so here's another one that you can practice for. Uh, so you are able to uh, do this for yourselves now. So if you pause and have a look and then when you play it again, I'll go through the answers for you. So this is a practice one now, one where you can do it for yourself. So pause here, have a go. So the answers. This time our school have decided, well, we've just done that. School is singular in terms of the group of uh, the institution word is, an, is a singular word, so it needs has, not have. Decided to take part in the reverse advent calendar appeal for our local feed, food bank. Right, calendar, spelt wrong, needs an A-R. And again, note that I need a capital C for calendar because I'm not correcting a capital letter error, I'm correcting a spelling error. There's a question mark at the end. It is hoped that each form group will discuss this during due to time and organise themselves to complete this task. That's not a question. Doesn't need a question mark. It needs a full stop. Donations such as dried foods. I know that's the wrong spelling of dried because I know that when I change dry to dried, I drop the Y and I add IED. Um, and then I have got received and I remember my rule I before E except after C. So therefore, after a C, it should be E I received. OK, so why do students lose marks in the writing section? Why is the writing section usually the one where students get the lower marks? Lots of reasons, lots and lots of reasons. One of them is because you simply don't practice enough. So here are some ways that you can practice. Obviously, going through this is a good practice. Some people just don't focus on the accuracy enough. You need to make sure that you've got the basics as accurate as you can. Your quality of your ideas are marked as well. So good ideas, interesting points will get you marked. Not being able to write enough in the time that you've got. Again, that comes back to practice. Make sure you practice it. Make sure you run through it so you know. You need to make sure that you use your language for effect and that can be a real uh, indicator of a high quality answer is when you start to use the vocabulary, the sentencing, the punctuation for effect. The way you structure and organise your writing is going to get you a good mark. So if you really think through before you start, if you plan it out, make sure you know how you're going, make sure your ideas are linked together. That is going to get you a good mark. Um, and obviously, if you don't read the question properly and you misunderstand it, you're going to lose marks. So always read through that question, practice um, slowing it down, reading through the question, breaking the question down to make sure you know what you're doing before you start to address that question. OK, so how can you practice all? Well, I've just gone through those with you, haven't I? Just explain to you how you can make those improved. OK, so the examiners, what do the examiners give you uh, some tips for? So they say that when you're approaching a writing question, always make sure you read the question at least twice. That way you're going to make sure you understand it. Make sure that you're planning, but make sure that you're generating ideas when you're planning, that you're not just writing down your structure. You're actually thinking about what you're going to include in those paragraphs. So you're generating the ideas as you're going, thinking about how you're going to link them together. How are you going to move from one idea to the next? 
Make sure that you really think about the beginnings and the endings so that you know exactly where your writing is going to be going. Make sure you keep a close eye on the time. If you realise that you're running out of time, why not adapt your writing, leave out one of your ideas, go straight to your conclusion so that you've got a finished piece. And then you do need to read over what you've written. You must make sure that you've got those basics as accurate as you can get them. So that means checking through for full stops, capital letters, making sure you've got the paragraph in right. OK, so you're going to be assessed for the quality of your writing. There are going to be different marks available. So 20 marks available for your uh, communication in your organisation, so your ideas, 15 marks for the writing accuracy. It says you've got to write between 350 and 500 words, so that gives you a sort of guide to how much. For most people, that's between two to three sides of A4, but you should be looking at that when you're doing your practices. You should be looking at that with your teacher and thinking about how much you write in the time that you've got. And really aiming to write quality work, which covers the minimum quantity that's required. So you're really making sure that you've got the quality in the writing, but that actually you cover those word limits. You get two uh, questions, you choose which one you're going to do. So here, describe an occasion when you or someone you know show courage. Description. All right. And then the second one, emergency and rescue services such as the RNLI do amazing work to save lives. Write an essay on the importance of emergency and rescue services. That's the exposition task. So in this particular paper, there's no narration task. There's no story task. So you've got a description task or an exposition task. So you know then that... Um, you know the structure that you need, you know the type of writing that you need to be doing. They're both linked and they're both related to the text that you've read. They will try and do this so that you get ideas, so that you can use the content from what you've read to help you with the writing. They will always do this so that you get some ideas from what you've read. There is nothing wrong with using the text in order to give you ideas for your writing. And make sure that you plan, always make sure you plan. You've got space in the booklet for planning. Here is the mark scheme and we will go through the mark scheme in a bit more detail as well. So there's a, another mark scheme later on, but it is well worth looking at what you need. You get two sets of marks. So the first band is for your uh, communication in your organisation. The second band is for the writing accuracy. So you definitely need to plan and proofread. Now, if you look at those marks, if you look at the bands, Roughly speaking, people talk about this, the band four as being where you're aiming to get to. OK, so you're looking to get about 13 out of 20 uh, out of 20 for this one. And you're looking for about 10 out of 15 for this one. That's roughly where most people are aiming for average grade. If you look at what you need in order to do that, it says about clearly controlled and well judged writing. You've got to know what you're doing. That quality of your idea needs to come through secure understanding of the reader's needs. You need to make sure that you are writing for your audience, that you've clearly understood the purpose and that you are writing for your audience. It talks about an appropriate register. It talks about convincing detail. Your story, your description, your exposition sounds good. It persuades. And it says that it's structured and clearly organised, that you have a clear sequence and it's fluent. So, even for that band four, you need to have a very well structured piece of writing. And if you look at the accuracy mark, sentence structure is varied for effect. Control of sentence construction. So you've written in full sentences and you've controlled those sentences for effect. Range of punctuation. So you're not just using full stops and uh, commas. You're using a full range of punctuation. So you might be using question marks, exclamation marks. You might be putting a little bit of speech in. You might be using colons or semicolons. It's about the range and the variety, but it's also about the effect that you create with it. So sometimes a really short sentence with an exclamation mark to create that impact as you read. It also talks about spelling is secure. So you have to try and aim to be the best that you can, knowing what you do wrong, knowing what your common mistakes are. You then need to proofread for that at the end of it. So over the year, as you're preparing for the exam, you need to be thinking about what do I do wrong? Do I often spell this type of word wrong? Should I be looking for that in the exam? Do I sometimes miss full stops and capital letters? Should I be checking for that? 
So it's about identifying your own errors so that when you finish the exam, you know what you're looking for so that you can be as accurate as you can be. OK, OK, let's move on. <clears throat> So the WJC say that planning is absolutely essential. They say take the title and give lots of reasons. And it says that if you're doing the exposition task, there is no requirement to persuade. So in an exposition task, you don't need to persuade. So you need to start by planning. And this is one way that you can plan. This isn't the only way. I'm just going to try and give you lots of different things that you can take away with you. So. <clears throat> With the planning, start with an introduction. Then you have three paragraphs where you want to put down three main points and a conclusion. And each of the paragraphs where you're explaining your ideas should follow the same structure. This is for an exposition task now. So you take your main topic sentence, you start with that point, the idea that um, the emergency services is important, is um, focused around, then you develop it with detail. So you give examples, you give evidence, you might give some statistics or some little stories, some anecdotes, but then you show the implications. If we didn't have the emergency services, then just imagine what would happen. So you give the implications and you do that for each of your ideas. And if you do that for each of your ideas, you'll find that you're automatically developing your points, expanding those paragraphs, you're making them longer. So you're following that structure. You've got a topic sentence, which you develop with detail. Then you give evidence and statistics for it. You use an anecdote and you give the implications and then you move on to your next idea. If you do that, you should end up with between 350 and 500 words. <coughs> Here's another way to expand your idea. Take your statement, explain your statement, give examples then explain the implications, use a little story and explain what it means for you. Now, if you're struggling with that every time, you could start thinking about that sort of um, ripple idea. Start with you. What does it mean for you? What might it mean for your community? What might it mean for Wales? So you can expand your idea by thinking about the further implications of what might happen for these people. And that will help you expand your idea. Because if you give an anecdote where you talk about yourself being saved, you could then expand that to talk about somebody in your community that you know who's had to use the emergency services. And then you could talk about the sort of wider implications for Wales if those emergency services weren't available. So it helps you to expand your ideas. <clears throat> If you use a statistic, don't just use the statistic. Think about why is that statistic important? How big or small is the issue? State the implications again. Link it back to your point. Back up with an expert. Make up an expert. Put down some statistics and some um, research which you've made up, which backs up your idea. They won't be checking whether that expert exists or not. It's about how well you can use that information to make it sound convincing and then explain how that supports your view. So that's another way that you can make a paragraph a lot longer by going through those steps. And this is another one, very similar, um, a structure again that you'll be able to see. Look, so it takes that introduction, three or four reasons with a conclusion, but for each reason you've given an explanation and you've developed it. So you need to make sure that you can expand on your ideas. So here's a little example of how you do that on a different topic. But this one's on the healthy eating. So people need to eat a healthy diet or they make themselves ill. Mm, yeah, that's true. But how can you go about expanding that? OK, here's a longer example. Being aware of the importance of eating a well-balanced diet is essential for health and well-being. Those who do not choose to eat a healthy diet are far more likely to be afflicted by a wide range of illnesses. So it's taken the information and this took the information from the text that they'd read and they brought it into their exposition essay. OK, so how could you go about opening <clears throat> an exposition essay? You could start by making a declarative statement, declaring something, giving an absolute factual point of information, which you then went on to expand. So a powerful statement with plenty of impact to open up. You could start with a rhetorical question. So if you're thinking about the exposition essay for the RNLI and the emergency services, you could start with a question which makes people think about their situation and about the importance of the RNLI. You could start with a single word, which you then went on to develop, thinking about that language for impact, single word, 
full stop, makes a powerful impact. You could start with tripling when you're using three examples of something. So there are four different ways that you could start an exposition essay. <clears throat> so the exam boards say that what you really need to think about is what and how. So right back down to the basics. What are you going to say? Which clearly is your content, your ideas, your structure. And then how are you going to say it? Think about your paragraphing, your punctuation, your sentencing, your word choice, the detail and the effect. So what are you going to say? How are you going to say it? And the how gets you almost as many marks as the what. So you really need to think about that. One of the ways that I get my pupils to think about this <clears throat> is we talk about PAFT. <clears throat> Purpose, audience format and tone. So this is a really good way to start thinking before you start writing. This is a good planning tool. So you write path down the side of your um, page and you look for the purpose. Well, with an exposition task, you're simply giving your ideas. That's nice and straightforward. The audience are the people who are going to read it. Who are you aiming at? Format is what you've been asked to write. So is the format a letter, an article? Um, a story, a description, or is the format of what you've been asked to write. And then the tone is the way that your voice is going to sound in that writing. Are you angry? Are you passionate? Are you informal? Are you formal? So thinking about the tone that you are going to be writing in, and that can help to shape the choices of words that you make. So when you're doing PAFT, when you're thinking about your plan, and this can really help. Why am I writing? Who am I writing for? What um, are the expected features? What do I need to include? So knowing that if I'm writing an article, I need headlines and I need subheadings and I need quotes from an audience. Whereas if I'm writing a report, I know I need lots and lots of structured paragraphs with subtitles in them. So thinking about the expected features and then thinking about your tone. So here is the question on the exam paper that we could use PAFT for. Emergency and rescue services do amazing work. Write an essay. So purpose. You're exposing your ideas. You're giving your opinions on the service. Audience. Anyone who's supporting the services or perhaps anyone who's thinking about maybe donating to a charity to support those services. Format is an essay. That's personal views. So it could be quite relaxed because it's about you, your opinion. Tone, conversational, but emotive because you're going to be expressing your views. In an exposition task, it's OK to be biased. You don't have to recognise both points of view. So it's an exposition essay and it's your views. So think about it. Who are you? Why are you writing? So this is your plan now. You're planning before you start. What are the positive views of the rescue service? What are the negative views that you could counter, that you could op give an op opposite point of view for? How can you oppose those negative views? Examples of why they're so important, and if you can't think of any, use the ones from the reading section. Talk about the rescues that you read about. And then your conclusion. It's a nice, straightforward way to do it. So you start with PAFT, do a quick PAFT, and then go through and plan what you're going to include in your paragraphs. So why don't you have a go at that now? Why don't you pause the video here, spend about 40 minutes writing? I would say you usually need five minutes to plan at the beginning. 40 minutes to write, five minutes to proofread at the end. Always save some of that time to check over and you're aiming for two to three sides of A4. A really quick way of seeing how much you write is to look at one of the longer sentences on your page. So look at a line across your page, count how many words you've got in that line, count how many lines you've done and multiply them. That gives you a very rough idea of how much you're writing if you don't know. OK, so pause here, have a go at that text. So in the exam, you're given three different writing types. We've already talked through the exposition now. So we've had a look at what exposition means, which is your idea of um, what you're talking about, your ideas on the topic that you've been given, offering opinions. But you also get description and narration. And therefore, you need to think about what are the different features of those pieces of writing? How can you make sure that you are writing clearly for the examiner under the purpose that they have set you? So an exposition text, generally speaking, is written in the simple present tense. 
you're using cause and effect language. You're talking about the because, if, therefore, and you're using the time and causal connectives. So if you're writing that essay on the R and L I, you're writing it in the present tense. You're using that cause and effect language. So you're talking about if this happens, then this will happen. Therefore, if this happens, then this will happen because. So you're using those connectives. You're talking about maybe in the formal voice if you wanted to, and you could do it in the third person impersonal. So you could talk about he, she, they, uh, and talk about the people of Wales and that sort of thing. So you can bring in that level of formality. But you are going to also try and include some technical vocabulary. So you're going to try and be uh, linked to the topic that you've been given. So we've looked through this. So I'm going to uh, not spend much time because we've spent all that time at the beginning looking at the exposition task. But typical tasks that might appear are ones that ex ask you to express your views on something. Sometimes explain a task, um, leaflets. But you're basically given a comprehensive idea. Here is the band five, the top end, the best mark that you can get. And they talk about it being mature and perceptive. They talk about it being um, wide ranging, ambitious, with appropriate vocabulary, which is uh, confident. So you, there's a style, there is a, a confidence in the writing and they're using language for effect and precise meaning. So it's worth considering what band five requires of you and aiming for that. OK, so not long on the exposition because we've looked at it already. So let's have a look at description and narration now. This is one that often trips people up because they're often wondering what is the difference? But you know what? You don't really need to stress too much about it. The exam boards say that a good narrative will use description anyway. So a good story is going to use description because we're always telling you to show, not tell. And therefore, we'll create the lively and interesting story. When you're writing a narrative, you're mostly focusing on the characters, what they did, how they feel, what was going on. When you're writing a description, you're mostly focusing on the detail and you're using the five senses. So that's your main difference. Narration is focused on the character, the action, what's going on. A description is focused on the detail and using the senses to try and create a vivid picture of it. But really, as long as you're writing well, you're probably going to be OK with these ones. There's two examples for you. You've got a description and you've got a narration here to show you the difference in the focus. The description is focusing on the sentences, the smells, the foggy fumes. It's focusing on the feeling, the atmosphere. Usual morning commute was chaos. So it's giving detail. The narration is focusing on the character. I was late again. I hurried as quickly as I could. So there's a difference in the focus here, and that is what you're trying to create when you're looking at the difference between a narration and a description. So we've got some uh, descriptive language features for you. It, it isn't a hard and fast rule. It's just some general tips. Having looked at lots and lots of descriptions, they tend to be in the past tense. They tend to be written in the first person, sometimes third person. They need to be lively and interesting. They need to use the five senses. This is the one where you're going to try and load it with techniques. So similes and metaphors, adjectives and adverbs. Practicing using those language techniques can help you get a really good grade. Narrative, the story. Again, mostly past tense. Again, third, first and third person. But this time we've got time connectives. It's chronological. You're going to talk about a story. You're going to use those chronological connectives. You're going to use really powerful verbs. You're going to keep it lively and interesting. You might include dialogue in a story. You don't generally put dialogue into a description. You try and avoid it, but you can put dialogue into a story. OK, so why do they call it narration in the exam? Why don't they call it a story? They tended to avoid the use of the word story because they wanted your uh, writing to be believable. They wanted the writing to be true to life. They didn't want the um, varied chronology that sometimes a story can have when you have flashbacks and flash forwards and when you have foreshadowing and things like that. They wanted it to be sort of relatively straightforward and they wanted it to be in the past tense. So a s narration is less imaginative, it's more functional. Got some examples for you. Write an article describing somewhere that you visited. Describe an occasion when technology made a difference. Describe an occasion when you found something rewarding. Describe a time when you faced a challenge. 
So let's have a look at it. So this is the one in the exam. This is the one in the unit two paper that we're looking at today, the 2022 paper. Describe an occasion when you or someone you know showed courage. So we know it's a description because that word at the beginning tells us that. We know that they want a really sharp focus on one occasion, one main event, and therefore it's one character. Synonyms. Right. OK, so let's think about other words for courageous so that we can really start to pin that down and really think about varying our vocabulary. We could talk about brave. We could talk about being fearless. We can talk about doing something heroic. Right. OK, so now I've got a variety of vocabulary and I know that I've got these 20 plus 15 marks, 20 marks for my what and the 15 marks for the how. OK, so I'm aiming for those two to three pages again. But focus on the one event, really sharp focus, crucial 10 minutes. Don't bother about the build up to it and the aftermath of it. Really focus in on that one moment when you showed that courage. Don't describe the whole day from the moment you got up. Really think about the structure. So you've got a really nice, clear beginning, middle and end. Usually with a description, you can start right in the middle of the action. So you can start right with a moment when you are having to be courageous. Maybe if there were other characters, just focus on one other one. Don't get a whole host of characters coming in. Just that focus on that one other character. That way you're really, again, thinking about describing. Um, give it a sense of where you are. Describe what's going on around you. Describe the sights, the sounds, the smells as you're being courageous. And then focus on your feelings and your setting. OK, you're not writing a story. Um, Often a reference to feelings. So you are going to be looking at feelings. So this one is brave and we've already talked about synonyms for that. So think about this then. When did you feel like this? <clears throat> and then again, pause now, have a think about this and see if you want to have a go at this one. So 40 minutes you'd spend writing about an occasion when you or someone you know showed courage. And again, there you've got your success criteria. Make sure you've got the um, writing accuracy, 40 to 45 minutes, five to six paragraphs. All right, so have a go at it. And then to finish off today, what I've got for you is a host of other ideas that you can go and practice. So other example questions which cover the same thing that you've just been practicing. So write an article, describe an occasion when technology made a difference. When did you enjoy taking part in an outdoor activity? Describe an occasion when you've given responsibility. So those are the similar sorts of questions. So you could choose one of those and have a go at one of those as well. And then we're going to look at now how you'd go about planning. So now some tips on planning. So I know that for a lot of you, this is not your favourite part of the exam. You don't get any ideas. You sit in the exam and it's just a total blank for you. So planning is going to be really useful. Think about that soap opera moment. Think about that drama moment. And when you're planning, keep it really brief. It's a brief glimpse. You enter late, you leave early. So you enter into the middle of the action and you leave possibly before it even finishes. But you've then finished your part of it. So your story is, is complete. Don't have too many characters. Make sure you keep it realistic. Don't use too much dialogue. So in the exam, just think about it as a job that needs to be done. You're not going to sit there and suddenly have this amazing idea fully formed. You've got to work through it. You've got to structure it. You have to pull those ideas out of your brain. So sit there, think it through, plan it out. Start with a little night nugget, the tiny little idea that you've got, and then try and expose, explode out from that so that you get that key word and you start to work around the idea of courage or the responsibility. And you really start to bring some around that to get your point. Take it and build it up. Keep it simple. Keep it local. Keep to what you know. Stick to what you know. And don't be afraid to take ideas from other people. As long as you're putting it into your own words, it's perfectly OK to use ideas that you've heard about before. It's perfectly OK to use the ideas from the reading section if you're putting it in your own ideas, in your own words. So make sure you're planning. Here are some more ways to do it. So you've got a descriptive piece. It's 10 minutes. Maybe think about the description of the setting, description of the weather, your thoughts and feelings, what happened, who the second character is. So a quick brainstorm before you start your exam. You could try this one as a way of um, planning if you liked it. H space. So you might start with the hook. How are you going to draw your person in? Where are you going to set it? Who's the other person? What is the action? 
What's the change? That's a really good way to hit those higher marks, that sophisticated structure, that idea of sort of language for effect. Bring that change in and then end it. Where are you going to finish it off with? So this is a good acronym to remember in the exam. H space for the descriptive and the narrative pieces. Obviously, in the exam, you're being asked to use language for effect. And I know you'll have heard this before, so you show not tell. The examiner is interested in seeing how well you can describe something, how well you can bring those details to life to make that picture vivid. So a simple way is to show, not tell, something your English teacher's probably been telling you for a long time. The bully was really tall, tells me that the bully was tall. It doesn't give me any detail. Whereas if I got the bully towered over me, it leads me to infer something. It leaves the reader a clue and they've got to work it out for themselves. It's much more engaging, much more interesting, and it gets you a better grade. So, um, with the descriptive and the narrative writing, they ask you to think about language for effect. So perhaps you might want to think about using some techniques. Oasis map is a really good way of remembering some of those techniques in the exam. I'm not saying you need to include all the techniques on the Oasis map, but perhaps try and use some of them. So Oasis map is another acronym. It stands for onomatopoeia, alliteration, simile, imagery, senses, metaphor, adjectives and adverbs, personification. If you wrote Oasis Map at the top of your exam paper, put down the techniques, you could choose then three or four of the techniques that you like that are going to help you give colour to your writing, going to help give detail to it. So this is an example of some good Oasis Map techniques. You can look at what makes a good one here. Um, and you've got some really nice descriptive language. So we've got some metaphors being brought straight into it. It was a world of glass. Well, no, it wasn't. It was just frozen. There were confections of sugar. No, it's just frost touching the trees, but it looks like confections of sugar. It's a really pretty way of describing a frozen landscape. Talks about a simile. We smelt, it smelt like needles. You've got the senses. We've got the sound. We've got the smell. We've got alliteration there. So it's useful to bring these techniques into your writing and just add that detail as you're going. OK, so here's another example. Here's another way of practicing if you wanted to. What about writing a descriptive paragraph about a day trip which stands out? You could have a positive or a negative one. And then you've got a challenge there. So if you've feeling like you need that challenge. How about trying to use five different sentence structures? How about starting in the moment, not the build up to it? How about including a tiny bit of dialogue? How about changing from a real close up of the description to a bird's eye view? If you're doing a day trip, what about changing from that moment on the bus when you're all squished together to perhaps watching as everybody spilled out to the coach onto the beach and think about the sort of descriptive language there that you could use then include your thoughts and feelings. And obviously with the proofreading, checking for capital letters, full stops, commas, checking the spelling of keywords. OK, so show, not tell. Practice. Write a one line description of a man smiling coldly. What about he was smiling, but it was a smile that was cold and white. How about. Adding um, Arctic into that. So you've got a description of a man smiling coldly with the word Arctic. You had a smile of Arctic brightness. OK, have another go. Here's another one. A one line description about a girl pestering her parents. She was pestering her mum and dad over and over. OK, so how about challenging that one? How about using the word fly? She buzzed around them like a fly. Yeah. It's good to try and challenge yourselves to use this language for effect. You know that's the AA star indicator. So try and include those details. OK. So last little uh, few slides now. Thinking about your word choice is going to really help you in the exam. So instead of just getting out of bed and going downstairs, how about you leaped out of bed and skipped downstairs? Really happy moment. Or how about I crawled out of bed? and um, hesitantly went downstairs. Again, changing it, making it different, okay? Thinking about those language uh, points. Dialogue can really help, but do not have the he said, she said, I said. Try and just use that little nugget 
of um, punctuation. Use that little nugget of dialogue just to try and build that story. It makes it real. Uh, it makes it real and makes it more um, graspable. And then here are some examples for you. This is a band four answer. So remember, we said that this is where you're aiming for and um, to try and get to that point to try and make sure that you're getting that C or above. This is a band four example and it's fine. Pretty focused. It's uh, using the relevant techniques. It's got a nice uh, variety of vocabulary in it. There are some sentencing errors. So then what does a band five look like? This one's really good. It's got a lovely, sophisticated tone. It's got some fantastic vocabulary in it. Um, sometimes it's worth just learning one or two really golden words that you can just drop in where relevant when you're writing. Sometimes that can really help to give a colour to your writing. Um, this one's got really nice varied sentencing and it's got humour. It's got this nice tone to it. So to finish off, top tips. Make sure that you've really thought about that path to purpose, audience, format and tone. So make sure your tone is appropriate for the task and the audience. Make sure you've got a range of ideas. Make sure you develop them in detail. Don't change your point of view halfway through. Right? Make sure you're sticking to it. You're arguing your point of view. Have a clear sequence. Use techniques, but don't overdo it. Keep it natural. Keep it nicely detailed. Use that variety of sentencing and vocabulary. Proofread, that is the biggest tip I can give you. Proofread really carefully, but definitely be ambitious. Be as ambitious as you can be, be as accurate and as detailed as you can be. Aim for your best piece of writing in this exam. So here is the um, mark scheme again, so that you've got a copy of that mark scheme. And here we go. So hopefully you are now familiar with the types of questions, the descriptive, the narrative, the exposition. Hopefully you now know how to go about planning the path and the um, different structures that you could use to plan for a piece of writing. And hopefully you're familiar with what you need. So that variety of vocabulary, that sentence variety, that ambitious and sort of challenging language that you could use. So hopefully you are ready for this exam now. And then thank you very much. This doesn't want to work now at the end. OK, so it does say thank you for attending the revision session. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. The next sessions are going to be on the unit three. So you've got a unit three reading, um, argumentation, instruction, and persuasion, and you've got a unit three writing. So if you've got any feedback, you can use the form there. Thank you very much.